Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining the Coalition for Liberty and Justice. The next panel is Bogus Arguments and Bad Medicine, Bishops in the Exam Room. And this panel will examine what happens when religion interferes with medicine. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Sonia Spoo, and I'm the Outreach Associate at Catholics for Choice, and I'll be the moderator of this esteemed panel of experts. Um, not myself, but everyone else. Um, and um, I'm going to give a short lay of the land and then hand it over to the panel um, for what I hope will be a very rich discussion. Please write down questions as you think about them. Um, we'll be open the floor for questions like we did in the first panel as well. Um, and, you know, as we go forward, uh, we'll have slides and stuff to sort of give some graphics of this issue. So Catholic health care is actually a big deal. It is likely that you or someone you know or someone you care about has had um, some kind of direct, has been some, somehow directly impacted by a Catholic health care system. One in six patients in the United States is cared for in a Catholic hospital. Yearly, that means five million patients are admitted to Catholic health care facilities and it accounts for over 16% of the beds and uh, medical facilities. And this number is growing. In many ways, Catholic healthcare holds an extraordinarily vaunted position within our society and within larger conceptions of medicine. And there is good reason for that. There is a history and theory of practice that, and values embedded in the system that have led to a certain quality of care um, afforded to millions that people would not maybe have access to otherwise. And also, it has been the beneficiary of very sophisticated and robust PR maneuvers and strategies. Um, we've seen this recently with the issue of Walgreens deciding to do um, clinic uh, work with Catholic healthcare facilities. Um, and Walgreens saw this as a big PR boon for them because people have a perception that Catholic healthcare is good healthcare. But Catholic healthcare has a dangerous blind spot when it comes to women's health. Catholic hospitals do not follow the dictates of evidence-based medicine or allow for doctors to follow the best course of care for their patients. Rather, Catholic hospitals and Catholic health care is controlled by a council of medically untrained men who seek to impose their stringent and medically unsound religious dogma on women. Ethical Religious Directives for Catholic Health Care Services, ERDs. These are the directives that guide Catholic hospital care. So what does that mean? Explicitly, it means that it forbids Catholic facilities from providing civil reproductive health care procedures regardless of the beliefs of the providers or those who are seeking these, this care. This means no access to abortion, even in the case of rape or incest, no access to in vitro fertilization or other artificial reproductive technologies, no treatment for ectopic pregnancies, no access to contraception, and no respect for advanced medical directives of patients. While there are exceptions for certain things like, you know, you can have emergency contraceptives, you can have emergency contraceptives if you can prove that you were raped or any other things. Even within these exceptions, which are very narrowly defined, um, because there's so much confusion and fear really about what care you can, on, you can or cannot provide within Catholic institutions, Many providers have reported and have, we have seen throughout studies um, will not even provide care when, there's exception, when, the, when these exceptions are being are met by the conditions that these patients are presenting with, um, which really leads to frustration amongst providers, which we'll hear a discussion about, um, and also just broad confusion and a certain sense of degraded and disjointed care for women when they're seeking out reproductive health care issues. Uh, and I think also one thing we'll hear a great deal about is that Catholic health care is big business. Um, despite being, I think, positioned as this charitable ring, this aspect of Catholic social justice values, um, Catholic health care brings in somewhere in the tune of over $200 billion in patient-generated revenue. Catholic health care systems represent four or five of the top 10 largest health care systems in the country. And again, that number is growing. We're seeing mergers happen more and more between Catholic and secular-based health care systems. 
And really what we're seeing is that Catholic hospitals and Catholic health institutions want to have their cake and eat it too. They receive federal funding through Medicare, Medicaid fund schemes, yet they, re they refuse to, to follow evidence-based medical practices that many other hospitals adhere to or are first to adhere to by various medical boards. And they claim these exemptions under the very effective guise of religious freedom and liberty. As we heard from the first panel, Patty talking about this a great deal as well. And it's important to recognize that these issues are not just not, do not just affect hospitals or healthcare facilities. Broader conscience clauses and religious exemptions have the further insidious spread of harm and illegitimate and spread have further have further an insidious spread of an illegitimate understanding of religious liberty and within the confines of care and health. We have seen this with Zupik be very well. Um, we have seen this in um, other healthcare cases, which I'm sure. Um, Adam will, will cover in his in his segment of the panel. But we've also seen this in terms of providing provide future providers the requisite education they need to provide services. So if you go to a Catholic university for your medical training, you will not be able to seek out training for abortion care. Um, and there are other ways that your training to be a provider will be circumscribed by Catholic values or beliefs. Um, and this has obviously broader impacts in terms of students throughout these universities and what kind of care they can receive at university medical centers or their Catholic universities and so on and so forth. Um, and we have seen what I think the first panel talked about, which is a sort of strange bedfellows of the Christian right evangelical movement merging together with the bishops to further these very stringent religiously motivated, religious, religiously discriminatory um, efforts to constrain access to abortion and other medical procedures within the Catholic healthcare setting. Um, and this impacts people's lives. And many people do not understand the consequences of having Catholic healthcare as a sole provider in their region or the area until their health is held hostage by the religious belief, by religious beliefs of a council of medically untrained men. So this panel will look closely at cases and of harm and talk about what this means in terms of systemic pr provision as in terms of what providers go through and in terms of the legal aspects and ramifications of this. Um, so I'm going to ask our panelists and throw it over to them. I'm going to ask that they um, state their name, of course, and their affiliation. That way people at home who don't have the program in front of them can um, know who's talking. And I'm going to head it, hand it on, on over to Susan Burke Vogel. Good morning. Almost afternoon. Is this on? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I am Susan Burke Fogel. I am the Director of Reproductive Health for the National Health Law Program. We are a national nonprofit law firm. We were founded in 1969, and we um, work to achieve legal rights to quality, comprehensive health care for low income and underserved individuals. Reproductive health is core um, to our concept of what quality comprehensive health care really means. Uh, we have been working on religious restrictions in health care since 1995 when I saw my very first hospital merger um, in Grass Valley uh, in Northern California. And, um, and we have particularly looked at um, how Healthcare refusals undermine and contradict medical standards of care. Uh, we wrote what I think was the first comprehensive analysis of medical standards of care in the areas in which healthcare refusals um, are operating and uh, demonstrate based on evidence uh, and medical standards and professional guidance how healthcare refusals um, undermine quality. Our perspective has always been that every person who goes into a provider's office, a medical setting, expects that they're gonna get the standard of care. And in fact, we have malpractice laws, right, that, um, that say that if you don't get the medical standard of care, you may have um, liability, the provider has liability. What healthcare refusals do is they um, basically give a get out of jail free card 
um, to these providers by saying that they are legally allowed to opt out of providing these services. And certainly one of the things that we're seeing these days um, are more and more challenges to what the boundaries of that opt out looks like, um, both in good ways and bad. So I'm going to really focus on healthcare systems, um, how Catholic healthcare um, and religious restrictions are operating within newly evolving healthcare delivery um, and some strategies to um, address them. So um, I already said this. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Um, I'm just following up on Sonia. Uh, this map is uh, from the Merger Watch Project, um, and they looked at the percentage of acute care beds by state um, in, in the United States. And if you look at, at this map, some of these states, um, Washington State, for example, nearly 41% of all of the acute care beds are in Catholic hospitals or Catholic-controlled hospitals. Um, you know, the Catholic Health Association itself says that one out of every six Americans will be seen in a Catholic hospital every year. Um, so the pervasiveness um, and the very hidden quality um, is, um, makes it very difficult for um, consumers to really understand what kind of health care they're going to receive. So. Um, we have all kinds of new evolving healthcare delivery systems, and I am not going to do um, acronym 101. Um, but I do want to point out how these new systems are involving Catholic delivery um, mechanisms and what that means for healthcare. So ACOs, you've probably heard, um, are accountable care organizations. Um, they are a closed network um, of, of wide variety of providers, um, and they refer to each other, they stay with, uh, patients have to stay within the network, um, and they, um, in the Medicare context, which is how they developed, they um, also are supposed to deliver quality care, comprehensive care, um, and cost savings. And the carrot um, to form an ACO is that, some of those cost savings come back to the system. Um, so if they save the Medicare program or the Medicaid program money, they actually have um, an incentive um, to perhaps provide better quality care, but maybe perhaps to uh, cut corners. The, um, the, um, the integrated networks are very much the same. So what happens, however, when an ACO is either driven by um, or just has a Catholic hospital or Catholic providers within its system? So for example, um, in Buffalo, New York, Catholic Medical Partners ACO, that's what it's called, all of the providers within that system um, are bound by the ethical and religious directives. They um, have nearly 700 local physicians, hospitals, and other care sites, and they serve 33,000 Medicare patients. And I just want to flag, we think of Medicare as for seniors, and mostly it is, but Medicare also covers people with long-term disabilities, low-income people with disabilities. And there are over a million women of childbearing age um, in the Medicare system. So the lack of access to reproductive health services is very meaningful um, even within the Medicare um, community. Um, in um, independent uh, physician associations, IPAs, which are like, they're like mini managed care plans. You have a bit, the managed care plan contracts with the IPA. IPA is incentivized to keep patients within their larger medical group. A lot of hospitals run IPAs. Um, there's a case right now um, that the ACLU brought um, where Mercy Hospital is, has an IPA and none of the doctors would remove, remove an IUD from a woman whose IUD had dislodged and was actually causing bleeding. They wouldn't touch the IUD. Um, I don't even understand how this conflicts with Catholic teachings because she wanted it taken out. 
I mean, she wanted one replaced, but she even just wanted it out, and they wouldn't do it. Um, so, I mean, who would expect um, that you wouldn't be able to get a service like that? And the challenges, of course, are whether these IPAs include other reproductive health services um, providers. Um, do they make referrals out of their system if a person needs a service that's not covered? Um, what do patients know? And of course, whether there are any kinds of quality um, quality measures. And I really want to talk about patient information because this is an area uh, that's like a black hole. Um, we have very few rules at the state or federal level that require any kind of information to be given to patients. And at the same time, we're seeing Catholic systems kind of changing their names and hiding their Catholic identity. So Catholic Healthcare West is now Dignity Health, and I'll show you their logo in a minute. You would never know. Uh, Sisters of St. Mary's in St. Louis is now SSM Health. Um, and so we are seeing more, um, we're seeing more systems not disclosing by their, by their iconography, by their names, um, that they actually restrict services. And we're seeing very few rules that require them to provide services. So I'll give you two examples, though, of some requirements to release information. California has a law. Um, that requires managed care plans, that puts the responsibility on the plan um, to have a, uh, a notice in, unfortunately, all the documentation they have to provide to enrollees, but they have to have a notice that some providers do not provide um, a whole list of reproductive health services, and the law is specific. So it doesn't do that kind of general reproductive health. It says family planning, abortion, tubal ligation. It's very clear, and the plan is supposed to have an 800 number that enrollee can call um, and find out where there are unrestricted providers in their network. Um, the new Medicaid managed care regulations that came out recently require that in the enrollee handbook, managed care plans have to put information about any services that they're not covering because of religious restrictions, and they have to um, tell en enrollees how they can get information about those services because they, they are Medicaid services. They're just not available because of these restrictions. So we have a few steps in the right direction. Um, so I'm going to pick up on this conversation about, um, you mentioned Walgreens, um, and really talk about um, what's happening in the market, the real market. Um, Big, big business is primary as urgent care centers. Uh, one just opened, there used to be a blockbuster not far from me, and now it's uh, some kind of urgent care centers. Th these are for profit. Um, um, they, um, even though they're called urgent care, they're really delivering primary care. Um, and uh, they advertise they're open on weekends, they're open evenings, they're open times that you know, are convenient for consumers to do everything from getting a flu shot to getting a basic checkup. Um, or you know, if you cut your finger making mango salsa, you can tell I did that, and you need <laughs> stitches. Um, that, those are, you know, they're open. They're open all the time. Um, and, and so they, um, they are, this quote, urgent care centers becoming a hot investment, is from Forbes earlier this year. Um, but what's happening with urgent care centers, uh, Go Health in particular, is that they are, um, they are partnering with Dignity Health. And you can see Dignity's logo. It's really lovely, and there's nothing Catholic about it. Um, Go Health is a for-profit. They have 70 clinics, um, either already open or being opened in New York, California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, and they, um, they are pretty much telling us nothing about what kinds of restrictions may or may not be available when Dignity is their partner. And this raises all kinds of questions. It, questions about a nonprofit partnering with a for-profit. 
What kind of regulatory framework is there? I will tell you there's almost zero regulation of urgent care clinics. There's only one state, surprisingly Arizona, um, that regulates urgent care, care clinics. They are not treated like clinics. They're not treated like um, emergency rooms. They are treated like doctor's offices. So they are like for-profit doctor's offices. Obviously, the providers have to be licensed, things like that. But there's no oversight. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do to make sure that they are being held accountable. And let's face it, you go to Go Health, how would you know that there might be some religious restrictions um, on the care um, that you are going to receive. Another example is Walgreens at the corner of Happy and Healthy. I kind of like them. Um, and I stayed away from using the W that looks like the Washington Nationals logo. Um, Walgreens, um, as you know, is on every street corner. Um, and Walgreens has operated um, clinics in their drugstores before. This is having a clinic in their drugstore um, is not new. And in fact, it's not a new concept. There, um, there are clinics in Target. There are um, this, you know, part of this retail, retail healthcare, which um, is off topic, but raises for all kinds of other issues about insurance and referral patterns and things like that that we're not talking about today. Um, but um, so Walgreens is partnering with SSM, and they're even you know, bragging about the fact that they're changing their name uh, from St. Mary's uh, of um, St. Louis. Um, and again, they are in different parts of the country. They are partnering with different Catholic uh, systems, the, at, with Advocate Healthcare, with Providence, which is the newest one in Washington, uh, in California, and in Oregon. Um, and what Walgreens is doing is they're, step, they're saying, we're just a landlord. Um, the Providence and Walgreens are just pointing fingers at each other. Um, Walgreens says, we're not operating the clinics, and, and uh, so we have enough, go talk to Providence. And Providence basically says, we have nothing to say here. We provide basic primary care. We only provide services that are appropriate um, in a retail clinic. And we say, oh, um, let's see, like birth control. Hmm. Um, like woman is miscarrying maybe, and maybe she's just bleeding. She wants to know what that's all about. Um, maybe she wants to know what her options are. Um, to them, that's not primary care. And there is a lot of advocacy going around now, um, currently trying to hold Walgreens itself accountable. I mean, can you imagine? You walk into a Walgreens drugstore. I have no comment about Walgreens as a corporation, but would you ever think, would any consumer ever, ever think that his or her healthcare options are being restricted by religious restrictions? And religious ideology? Um, it's completely um, opaque um, to patients. So, and with that, um, thank you. I'm going to pass it on to Wayne. Thank you to my good friend Susan. We've known each other since 1990. We were babies. We, we were, were toddlers in childcare yes. together. <laughs> so my name is Wayne Shields. I'm president and CEO of the Association of Reproductive Health Professionals. And what ARHP does is educate healthcare professionals on sexual and reproductive health. And we're kind of the certifying body, do accredited education, do a lot of training. And we focus on sexual and reproductive health broadly, which includes women's health, but it's for all genders and gender identities. Um, it's also for a range of care. So uh, this is a really key issue for us. I've been asked to give you kind of a general on the ground view. Can you hear me? Is that better? Okay. I've been asked to give you a general on the ground view of the perspective of individual healthcare providers and how their practice has been affected by these systems we just heard about and other factors. Um, but before I get to that, I just want to say thanks, Catholics for Choice. Really good event. I appreciate you inviting me, and we're a proud member of your Coalition for Justice and good work. Um, so I'm going to move on and start by saying that 
the problem of ideology and religion hurting clinical practice um, is a real uh, difficult issue in healthcare right now with a lot of permutations. And uh, it does hurt clinical practice, but it also ultimately hurts everyone. Uh, the providers I work with, their main concern is ensuring that the folks that they help in a clinical setting have a healthier life. And so it really is about individuals. So I think that's the focus, individuals. Um, I'm going to focus on three areas, but primarily on the Catholic hospitals uh, concept. But just please know that uh, there are three areas of influence from what I see on the ground in healthcare that uh, create really bad situations for healthcare providers uh, and uh, with religious and ideological influence impacting care. Uh, it's, it is Catholic hospitals, but it's also legislative bodies that are influenced by their individual beliefs. Crazy, cray, cray stuff happened in the States, let's face it. Um, and it's varied widely. And then, of course, by highly motivated individuals in various settings. You have maybe a, a, a fervent Catholic doctor practicing in a standard non-Catholic um, environment who will have an impact on their uh, individual patients. So those are all three important, but I'm going to spend the most time on the Catholic hospitals piece. But I do want to make sure we're clear about what the word provider means, because I spend my life in that world, and it's not just the doc, it's not just the nurse. It's, uh, we talk about it at ARHP as the entire team, so it's everyone who has some role in helping increase the quality of care for individuals, and that is, you know, it is the docs, it's the nurse practitioners and the physician assistants and the nurse midwives and increasingly the pharmacists, especially in the West Coast, uh, but also the medical educators, the counselors, the therapists. So. Uh, if you think of it as a broad team, all of whom have a role at the table. So when we get back uh, feedback at my organization about what happens, it's from all of these different perspectives, and it goes back to what systems do they practice in. They work within these systems, and they're different. They're hospitals and universities and clinics and pharmacies and, you know, these, these quick clinics that are uh, popping up. A lot of care happens in there uh, increasingly, and of course it has for a long time at pharmacy counter, and now that's being emboldened in, a, in, I think, a good way. So I'm going to talk about the ideal world and then the real world. In, in the ideal world, uh, providers at all levels are trained in the scientific method. They focus on the quality of care. They learn strategies. They learn practice. They learn standards. And it's all based on the best scientific evidence. Um, and the goal is to work to help patients live health, healthy lives. Now, one major change that has impacted that type of education over the past seven years has been the ACA. Yes, it's messy, but the ACA has had a major influence on our approach to sexual and reproductive health care. Uh, there's more, more focus on access to care for folks who didn't have it before. That's new, and we've made some great strides in that area, I think, and a lot of my folks work in that world. Uh, there's more focus on increasing the quality of care. There's more focus on the needs of the autonomy of individuals. So uh, that's an important change in healthcare for providers and that it's no longer, you know, the doctor is God. It is, you know, an exchange of good information and every individual makes their own decision about their care. So that's really important. But in the real world, you know, it's super messy. We live in a super messy world. Our healthcare providers in those crazy, crazy context of healthcare changing and really the health systems don't work very well. I mean, um, and who knows if they will, they're, trying to improve, but in the United States, they just don't work very well, and people don't always do a great job. That's true, too. You know, we have the variance of individual skills. Um, so what we've seen is also that women's health care, family planning, sexual re reproductive health care is being moved, primarily because of the ACA, into primary care. So yes, it brings up questions about standards and practices, but individuals are now being challenged, and if you're in a public health center, you're re required by law to provide good family planning care if you are in a primary care health care clinic and you get federal funds. You have to do it, and 92% of them are not. So I would say think about the term of average when it comes to quality of care, how individuals provide care. Most health care in the U.S. is about average. It's not great. It's, it's improvement. There are many outliers on all sides, but the real world is, you know, we're not there yet. But look what's happening. We have something else on a grand scale that is impacting the ability to provide this good care. And that is the impact of personal beliefs and ideology and religion on healthcare practices. Back to the Catholic hospitals. They're hurting the healthcare provider's ability to provide appropriate care 
which um, is disturbing and upsetting. And I'm going to go to one chart. I only have one. You know, you have, it's not an official presentation without a pie chart or a bar chart. So here you go, uh, at least in my world. Uh, but here, the reason I'm showing this is because the state and lo local government and the nonprofit, non non government uh, uh, health care hospitals look at the huge chunk. That's 78%. That's, that's like eight out of 10 hospitals are, that's where the Catholic hospitals fall in those two areas. State and lo local governments, that's the legislative bodies that pass crazy, crazy, crazy regulations and laws that don't make sense. So we're dealing with a huge uh, sector of our hospital systems. Wayne, real quick, sorry. Can you move your microphone a little bit closer to you? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, is that better? So we already heard about the bishop's directives that impact the ability to provide health care, you know, no contraception, no sterilization, no infertility treatments, IVF stuff, no abortion, no ectopic pregnancy uh, stuff. Um, and how my people, healthcare providers, have to follow those rules if they practice in that clinic and hospital or whatever environment it is. So what I'd like to do is just provide some examples. Uh, what I did was I went out to my 14,000 healthcare providers and kind of did a general request, give me examples of what you've seen today, yesterday, last week, whatever. And, and, and they're, they're probably what you would expect, but let's look at it. I mean, we're talking about individuals. Um, oops. We're talking about individuals who practice, whose jobs are affected by the policies of kind of old white guys who are not clinicians. So that, there are a lot of rules that don't make sense. Um, you know, it's not okay for uh, evidence-based practice to say that you can't uh, appropriately care for someone who's going through a miscarriage or uh, ha has a potential ectopic pregnancy. It's not right. Um, my, um, I'm going to go through these others real quickly. You know, it's also, I hate to say it, all white guys in legislatures who uh, also uh, are there um, impacting what we're doing. My pharmacist friends would kill me for the slide, but there's the conscious refusal from pharmacists primarily, uh, a problem. But here's the healthcare providers. What are they gonna do? Um, a member of my board, I'll call him Mark. He's a doctor, he's an OBGYN. He uh, continually sees, he just had a general comment that he sees women with premature ruptures of their membranes for unviable fetuses. They don't get the medicines they need. They don't get measures to empty their uh, uteri in Catholic settings. And they're sent across town inconveniently, not just inconveniently, at the, at the uh, risk of the patient's health, sometimes 80, 100 miles to another hospital to complete a miscarriage that's already underway. And, and, and some of these folks are very poor and don't have the funds you know, to take care of this, and their health is in jeopardy. Um, the same doctor saw many patients who had no idea that they couldn't get a tubal ligation at the, at the Catholic hospitals after delivering, and they ended up pregnant again when they didn't want to be. And I, it, you know, I didn't go into the details of, about uh, the risk, health risks, but pregnancy has many more health risks than contraception. And um, a nurse practitioner, her name's Anne, so, uh, just last week encountered a, a low-income woman who wanted a postpartum tubal ligation, but the Catholic hospital wouldn't let her do it. And they sent her to a hospital 50 miles away that didn't take her insurance and she didn't have money. So that's not just a health concern, that's a, a access concern. And that's a huge deal. And I'll give one more example. Um, I did get the one with the IUD, of course, because that's been in the news. Um, and then Scott, he's a family planning physician. He had someone coming in to his clinic, the family clinic clinic for an abortion, but he thought she had an ectopic and sent her out to the hospital, the only one nearby. And they refused to look at her because of the potential ectopic pregnancy. She had to go to another hospital, which also <coughs> refused. Then um, uh, she came back, you know, 72 hours later, um, she finally got her, her uh, medical medication abortion, and it was successful, but it was quite the trial. So those are just three examples of many. Um, I'll stop there. There's so many things that happen in terms of the individual frontline experience, but I'd love to hear your questions about how you uh, see the impact of your healthcare providers or those that you work with and see uh, with these ideological religious um, uh, barriers to care. Thank you, Wayne. 
Great. Do you remember where you were on August 1st, 2012? You don't remember. Because that was the day of the beginning of the end in, of freedom in America as we've known and loved it. According to L. Brent Bozell, president of the Media Research Council. I'm sure you can also recall that day because that was the day that our most cherished liberty was thrown into a government dumpster and hauled away, according to the Catholic Advocates President, Matt Smith. And perhaps if it'll help you jog your recollection, uh, I'll quote the words of U.S. Representative Mike Kelly. You can think of the times America was attacked. One is December 7th, that's Pearl Harbor Day. The other is September 11th, that's the day the terrorists attack. I want you to remember August 1st, 2012, the attack on our religious freedom. That is a day that will live in infamy along with those other days. So if for some reason you can't remember where you were on August 1st, 2012, that's the day that uh, the 99% of American women who've used contraception, including 98% of Catholic women, could kiss their copays goodbye thanks to the uh, Affordable Care Act's uh, contraceptive coverage benefit that of course covered contraception without a copay. Uh, now, the statements I've given uh, are illustrative, I think, of two things. First, they demonstrate the nature of the clash that we're discussing um, and that is played out between religious liberty um, and uh, uh, reproductive health care. Uh, and the second, I think, is the uh, extent of the clash, the, the level of um, vitriol uh, that is going uh, on in this decision, in, in this uh, uh, fight. So my name is Aram Chavez. I'm senior policy counsel at the Center for Reproductive Rights. And the Reproductive, Center for Reproductive Rights, uh, we're going into our 25th year, uses law and advocacy to promote reproductive rights as rights that governments are obligated to respect, protect, and fulfill. Um, we work both in the United States at the federal and state level, um, as well as internationally uh, in other nations, uh, at regional human rights bodies, and at the UN. So what is the link between reproductive rights and religious liberty? Well, of course, in principle, religious liberty is very broad. It's about lots of things, the freedom to believe and worship as one chooses. But uh, recently, we've seen that concept get a bit derailed and, and perhaps hijacked by those who see it as a means of discrimination against some disfavored groups. LGBT individuals, uh, which I won't be discussing or won't be the focus of my remarks, but also women seeking access to reproductive health care. And it's important that this latter group, women seeking access to reproductive health care, that, that reproductive health care in this concept, in this context, is uh, a service like an abortion or a commodity like contraception, but it also goes much further than that. Uh, and the first super female Supreme Court Justice, Sandra Day O'Connor, said it well, um, that the ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives. And I think it's really important to remember that yes, we're talking about services, yes, we're talking about commodities, but fundamentally those are tied at a very, very basic level uh, to women's status and equal status uh, in this country. So I'd like to talk a little bit about three areas um, where we've seen this play out. Uh, one is in the courts, uh, the second is in some uh, statutes, and then the third is uh, internationally and, and what this looks like. With respect to the courts, uh, I mean, people are obviously familiar with, with Hobby Lobby and Zubik, but just to give kind of a little bit of background of the, the context, of course, we know most American women want two children. Um, we know that America has a very high rate of unintended pregnancy. About half of all pregnancies in the US are unintended and it's substantially lower um, elsewhere in the developed world. Um, and that there's been a very large increase of unintended pregnancy below the poverty rate and that uh, affordability of contraception remains a barrier. That half of women 18 to 36, for instance, have struggled to afford birth control um, and there are studies that have borne this out. The bottom line being that affordability of contraception is of course an important public health um, concern. Um, as folks also know, when the contraceptive coverage benefit was rolled out, there was originally an exemption for houses of worship and then later an accommodation for nonprofits that were religiously affiliated, such as religious charities 
or religiously affiliated hospitals and universities was added, um, whereby a separate entity, uh, usually the insurance company or a third party administrator would provide the contraceptive coverage if the employer didn't want to have it covered directly in, the, uh, in their primary health care plan. Now, of course, uh, Hobby Lobby uh, decided uh, that the Supreme Court level decided that uh, the accommodation that had heretofore been open only to uh, nonprofits would also be open to closely held for-profit corporations and, and presumably all for-profit corporations under RIFRA. Um, and one of the, the turning points of it, of course, that this case was brought under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, one of the turning points of it is that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act requires that any kind of government regulation that impinges on or allegedly impinges on someone's religion um, be done using the quote unquote least restrictive means. And uh, the court found that there was a, le a less restrictive means available, uh, that being the accommodation. And you know, in some ways that made sense, in some ways it didn't. The problem with RIFRA is that that term least restrictive means is an absolute. It's not that RIFRA requires a very restrictive means or a very narrowly tailored means. It requires the least restrictive means. And that's really a problem. It's what I sometimes refer to as the Highlander problem for those of you who grew up in the 80s and, and know of that fantastic film. There can be only one. There's only one means that is the least restrictive. Um, and that becomes really problematic because, of course, the court uh, you know, has uh, nine, I guess now eight, uh, uh, imaginative members who could presumably imagine all sorts of less and less and less restrictive means, because something is always slightly less restrictive. And remember, it's least restrictive with respect to the person who's bringing the allegation, not with necessarily the class of all people. In the uh, follow-up case, uh, Zubik was, of course, related to Hobby Lobby, but also brought up a whole new issue. So Hobby Lobby was about taking advantage of this accommodation that was already available for a certain class of employer and not for another class of employer. And even under Hobby Lobby, if you take the court at its word, Justice Alito talks about the impact on women being actually zero. Now, we disagree strongly with that as a matter of fact, that, and in fact, that has been borne out. So for example, the court ruled in Hobby Lobby, and then it took literally almost a year to get regulations through that would uh, accomplish what the court was trying to do. During that time, women who worked, for example, at Hobby Lobby did not have access to contraceptions through their insurance. So certainly the impact on women was not zero, but at least we agree with Justice Alito that that ought to be the point, that that there ought to be seamless impact if there has to be some sort of uh, accommodation made for religious entities. Um, the challenge in Zubik really was kind of not tweaking the system, but really kind of overturning the entire table. Uh, and the argument was that filling out this form, which I have here, uh, filling out your name uh, of the organization, name and title, mailing an email address, signature and date, which would take you a grand total of perhaps a minute or two to, to fill out, was too great of an, uh, of an imposition on religious beliefs and that uh, even the, um, that even the, uh, I'm only on six minutes, I think I'm okay so far. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, that, uh, um, uh, that even that was too much of an imposition uh, to be permitted um, under RIFRA. And that's really problematic because if you don't have the accommodation, uh, then presumably there's that, that a whole set of people that are not just houses of worship, but a whole other set of groups could get a complete exemption from providing reproductive health care. And as we mentioned before, given uh, the impact of unintended pregnancy in this country, that's a real problem. Um, so the Supreme Court, as folks know, uh, issued a decision that was not a decision, but essentially, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, punted it back to the state, sort of said, or back to the, uh, back to the lower court, rather, um, sort of saying, well, we're not really sure how to work this out. We have this idea. Uh, what if objecting employers could get insurance without any kind of contraception, but not say that they were getting it without contraception? It would sort of be obvious, but without them having to say it, and that, that omission would then provide the requisite notice. And, you know, it's an interesting idea. The problem, of course, is that that wasn't an issue that was really squarely addressed before the court at the time that they posed the question. And it certainly hadn't gone through the legislative process. Would it work? The answer is, in some ways, who knows? And that's where we are today. Quite literally, we are in a process uh, where the Obama administration has said, 
we're not exactly sure what we should be doing. Do you have any good ideas? Um, and if you do have any good ideas, uh, you can go to regulations.gov by September 20th and submit your comments. I'm not kidding. Uh, go to regulations.gov by September 20th and submit comments uh, to help out the Obama administration try to figure out and parse what the Supreme Court said or intended. Uh, the Supreme Court's decision is sort of, you know, you guys just work it out. Um, and you know that that's a fair point to make as a as a point of arbitration, but you know the, people don't don't agree and haven't been able to work it out, which is why it, it ended up at the court. Um, I'll speak very briefly uh, about Whole Woman's Health uh, versus Hellerstedt, which is the the abortion case that the Supreme Court decided, and one that uh, my colleague uh, Stephanie Todi argued that that was our case, which is really exciting. Um, I don't want to talk about it too much because religion was not squarely at issue. Um, in the case. But what wasn't in the case were regulations of abortion providers, in this case in Texas, um, that were supposedly intended to make abortion safe, so safe that there would only be, you know, one or two or a tiny handful of clinics in the entire state that would be able to make it and that no one would actually have access to it. Um, but it was fairly transparent. So, for example, Governor Perry uh, said that the, uh, the ideal world is one without abortion. Until then, we will continue to pass laws to ensure that they are as rare as possible. Um, Texas State Representative and HB2, the, the, the bill's uh, author, Jody Laubenberg, said, I'm so proud that Texas always takes the lead in trying to turn back um, what was started in Roe versus Wade. Um, and so while the case did not directly uh, address the issues of religious liberty, uh, it's important that um, it was uh, uh, where a legislature was embracing uh, policies that it claimed were in the name of science, but were actually based on perhaps religious belief, perhaps moral beliefs, but certainly not science and certainly not public health. And the court was really able to uh, see through that, saying that each uh, of these burdens created by Texas places a substantial obstacle in the path of women seeking a pre-viability abortion, each constitutes an undue burden, and each violates the federal constitution. And uh, Justice Ginsburg in her concurrence added that laws like HB2 do, quote, little or nothing for health, but rather strew impediments to abortion that cannot survive uh, judicial inspection. This is really, uh, um, you know, these were not laws that were about science or public health, but these were laws that reflected either religious ideology or moral beliefs or something else. Speaking of those kinds of policies, uh, moving from Texas to the federal level, I mean, there's a number of different uh, laws, and uh, given uh, time, I won't get into all of them, but you have things like the Church Amendment and the Weldon Amendment, which are riders that uh, limit, um, you know, quote-unquote discrimination, uh, which say that federal funds can't uh, subject any institutional or individual health care entity to discrimination based on its refusal to provide, cover, or refer for abortions. And you know, that is problematic on its face, more so even when you think about, you know, a pharmacist who for, for perhaps incorrectly says that, a birth con that birth control causes abortion or a doctor who is called upon to terminate a pregnancy in order to save a woman's life or, um, you know, and especially the, the issues around non-referral are, are particularly um, problematic. And we've also exported some of these uh, through our foreign policy. There's religious refusal clauses in PEPFAR, which is an enormous fund of money that goes to fight um, HIV around the world. Uh, and there are other examples as well. There was also something that happened last year where funds that were earmarked for uh, undocumented, unaccompanied minors. I mean, this is really the, the most vulnerable group you can possibly imagine, uh, many of whom uh, were, a number of whom had been sexually assaulted and, and, and raped, uh, that folks that were offering services to these, uh, to these vulnerable people got this opt out from, from discussing any sort of reproductive health care, even to um, you know, unaccompanied minors uh, who, had, who had been raped. Um, so why are these kinds of policies harmful? Uh, they harm women's health. Uh, they undermine broader policy goals. They violate canons of medical ethics, where doctors really have to do what's in the interest of the best patient. Um, they violate the rights of religious conscience of conscientious providers. Obviously, many doctors also have religious beliefs and are motivated, and I want to close with that in just a moment. Um, we also want to remember that the burden of these kinds of laws, like most laws, falls most heavily uh, on the poorest and most marginalized members of society, that people who have, are wealthy, who have good insurance, who have access, will be able to find their way to quality health care, and it's people who don't have those kinds of options um, will often be, be paying them the highest price. Um, 
these laws and, and provisions are also and often a one-way ratchet. It is very easy to create a religious exemption. It is much more difficult politically to remove them, um, and that they each sort of become self-justifying. It becomes a ladder. Well, we already have three or four religious exemptions, so what's one more? And then if we have that fourth one, what's another one or two? And, and so pretty soon it becomes like Swiss cheese. I'll give just, um, just another minute, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, just to mention, you know, that these, on, from the international level, that these things are, are, are problematic. So, for example, the Human Rights Committee, which oversees the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, of which the U.S. as a state party has recommended that states introduce regulations to prohibit the improper use of conscience clauses by the medical profession. Uh, the Women's Rights Conventions Committee said that if health services uh, providers refuse to perform services based on conscientious objection, measures should be introduced to ensure that women are referred to alternative health providers. But again, as I mentioned, the Church and Weldon Amendment, for example, don't require that. Um, there are other uh, uh, entities, so the European Court of Human Rights, for example, have, has mentioned that pharmacists who refuse to provide birth control cannot give precedence to their religious beliefs and effectively impose them on others. And other countries have done a much better job. So Colombia, uh, interestingly enough, and that's a country, of course, that has, you know, predominantly Catholic, um, the constitutional right court has said, yes, you, there is such a thing as religious ob objection or, or conscientious objection, but it's an individual right not an institutional one. It has to be in writing. There has to be a requirement of referral. Uh, it only affects providers who are directly involved in providing health care, not support staff. Um, and it goes on to say that uh, although health professionals are entitled to express their conscientious objection, they cannot abuse this right by not immediately referring the pregnant woman to another physician that is willing to perform the procedure. This is in the case of abortion. Um, so just to close, I, I, you know, there's a lot that can be done opposing the expansion of these kinds of provisions, uh, supporting bills that would eliminate them. So things like the Do No Harm Act that was introduced earlier this year that would amend RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and not permit these kinds of, uh, to operate when there's third party harm. Um, and finally, really thinking about providers embracing a constitutional commitment. And I, I want to just quote very briefly um, some words from Dr. Willie Parker, uh, you know, doctor in Mississippi who is the only abortion provider in the state who submitted this um, in, in an amicus brief in the context of Whole Woman's Health versus Hellerstedt. He, this is what he wrote, and I'll close with this. Uh, Growing up in Alabama, religion was of deep importance to me. As a teenager, I was born again, preached in Baptist churches, and knocked on doors to share the word of God. In the first part of my career, I didn't do abortions. I considered them morally wrong. But I grew increasingly uncomfortable turning away women seeking abortions. Reading a sermon by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King on the Good Samaritan challenged me to a deeper spiritual understanding. The Samaritan cared more about the well-being of the person needing help than what might happen to him for stopping to give help. I wrestled with my conscience and realized that to show compassion to my patients, I needed to be able to provide abortions. My belief in God tells me that the most important thing you can do for another human being is to help them in their time of need. And that's why I've provided abortions full-time since 2009. I do not miss my easier path. I know that providing abortion care is just and noble and right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our panelists. Can you guys hear me? There you go. All right. Um, if not, I talk very loudly as well. Um, we are going to change it up a little bit from the previous panel and open it straight up to questions from the audience. I think there's a lot to unpack here from all these really great experts on these issues. So um, Sarah and Glenn, again, have the mics. If you want to raise your hand, they'll bring the mic to you. Um, and if you guys need me to jog some questions out, I can also ask questions as well. But anyone have any questions so far? Um, I don't know, if, uh, my name is Gerard again. I don't know if this is kind of like a, a jumping question, but um, in terms of like religious ideology um, and reproductive health services, I, I, can, I think it's safe to say that it has a very kind of misogynistic um, uh, history to it. And so since we're, it's 2016, we're reaching new technologies, you know, having new um, services to access and reproductive health is very much reaching its way into um, the context of male reproductive health. And so I was wondering what you all thought of how um, religious institutions and religious ideology would respond to providing um, sexual and reproductive health um, like access to like certain contraceptive, contraceptive methods for men. 
I would say they would respond the same way. Um, in fact, the, um, the prohibition, uh, you know, we've been talking about women's health, but the Catholic directives um, really just prohibit sterilization. So they prohibit vasectomies as well as tubal ligations. Um, and, you know, we may see a male contraceptive someday, hopefully. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, and they will prohibit that. Um, I can tell you I worked on a hospital merger in Gilroy, California. Gilroy is the garlic capital of the world, if you didn't know. You can smell it for miles. Um, and uh, when a Catholic system took over the local hospital as community clinics, um, they told the nurses to, quote, take those condoms off your desk. Uh, we know that internationally um, that um, there have been some horrific videos and um, arguments coming from the Catholic hierarchy against the use of condoms to prevent the spread of AIDS. Um, one has a, 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 a fake doctor, you know, somebody in a white coat looking under a microscope and um, then you get the blow up of the condom and the condom has holes in it, mm. you know, arguing condoms don't work, they won't help you, you shouldn't be using condoms. Um, so I think that you're right about the misogyny. I think that um, the truth is that our healthcare system has more reproductive health services for women. Um, but we are starting to see um, these um, objections also playing out in terms of transgender health, which we didn't talk about. Um, and so you know that um, we have brand new regulations under the ACA under Section 1557. 1557 is an incredibly powerful anti-discrimination law that for the first time prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in healthcare. And, um, and the basis of sex um, has been uh, interpreted to include uh, gender identity, to include transgender, and we've seen our first lawsuit brought by the Beckett Fund, the same great folks who brought us um, many of the contraceptive cases, and they're representing the Franciscan Alliance hospital system, and five states, our friends in Texas, oh, and a few Texas. others. Um, here we go, Texas, Wisconsin, Nebraska, Kentucky, and Kansas, and they are arguing that the, uh, they have the right to discriminate against people who are transgender, um, and, and to, to prohibit them from discriminating uh, violates their religious beliefs. Uh, and we will see how that case plays out. So um, these issues are, um, you know, our focus was on women's health, but they definitely are much broader. Mm -hmm. I would encourage all of us to focus more on, we use the term sexual and reproductive health to describe the umbrella, and we don't tie it at AHP directly to gender. Um, because there's the, not just new technologies for pregnancy prevention, et cetera, are coming ab aboard for men. They're also what they call multi-purpose prevention technologies that will be here within five to 10 years that will protect against contraception, STIs, HIV concurrently. Those are really fascinating, not gender specific. Um, I think the issue with the Catholic hospitals and ideology and religion has more to do with dictating behavior regardless of gender. And so, you know, we want best practices that bring the best health care to the people who need it. Just to add, add one other point, just for, for, for context on, on Section 1557, which, you know, is a fantastic provision. Um, so the Obama, you know, it's obviously like any law, there's a lot of, you know, question of what, is it all, what does it all mean? And so there was, there was a, a whole rulemaking about 1557 that went on uh, earlier this year, or last year, and um, you know the administration comes and says, "Well, he here's some ideas that we have. You know, we love your comments." And they were really progressive on um, on LGBT and especially the T piece. Really progressive. They said, "You know, there's no no place for discrimination in healthcare." But but we're, what about would you guys be open to maybe discrimination against women for religious reasons as just like the one place we could do that? And you know we were like quite like that right I'm, yeah. well I'm, I'm 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 being a little bit flip of course but but you know uh, uh, you know the center and, and and a number of other groups um, you know responded really strongly and 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 there was something that was both predictable about that but also I think really bothersome about that the idea that that you know oh of course we would never discriminate but you know but discrimination against women 
on religious reasons, you know, that that's sort of okay. And you know, we wrote back and others wrote back saying strongly, no, that's not okay. And 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 to their credit, the administration walked walked that back a bit. Hi, my name is Christy. I have no affiliation. I'm just a nurse on my day off. And um, I do specifically work in um, HIV and AIDS care. And so I was interested if you could expound any more on the comment that you made about PEPFAR and the way that this has, um, these ideas have impacted that. And I also wanted to know if any of you are aware of, I work a lot with um, PEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis and, and PrEP, po um, post-exposure prophylaxis. Sorry, I said this backwards. but. Um, and I was just wondering if you have seen anything analogous to like, you know, these blocks to um, reproductive health, if you have seen this in any of the HIV prevention, because I personally haven't seen it here in DC, anybody restricted from accessing PEP or PrEP based on, you know, like religious health care or anything like that. Could I start with that just in the US experience? I haven't seen it either. Most of the objections that I've seen to PrEP and PrEP over PEP have been from individuals have been Explain what those are for people who don't know. Yes, you, um, you described it earlier. It's uh, pre, uh, prophylaxis before um, you engage in sex, and then there are after sex called PEP. So it's post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and uh, they're getting a lot of play, but most of the objections have been from individuals and private institutions and folks who uh, it's not necessarily ideology, uh, religious basis, more ideological in that uh, they're afraid that it encourages bad behavior. And I think, I, from what I can see, we're moving past that. I haven't seen it have a religious uh, side yet in, in my experience. Um, I mean, just to respond, sort of, I, you know, the, the, the example I gave on, on PEPFAR was sort of in the broader context of foreign assistance. And I, I didn't get into it because I went, actually you didn't run out of time. I went over time. But uh, I mean, there's a number of ones I mean, there's, there's, that are still law. So there's something like something called the Livingston Amendment that we've had since the 80s that talks about. Uh, you can't discriminate against foreign aid grant recipients who offer quote unquote natural family planning. But unfortunately that hasn't, you know, regard, regardless of whether that's actually as effective um, or, or not. Um, so that's sort of one example. PEPFAR has a religious uh, refusal clause where, where organizations that get PEPFAR funding uh, can refuse to provide reproductive health services or referrals. Um, uh, based on religious beliefs and 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 you know i mean one of the reasons it's not baked into the policy but sort of the political reason why you know we know that access to contraception is an important part of hiv prevention but that there was a really clear mandate um both in the law but also from the administration, this administration, that said no, 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 no contraception funds because it will embroil it in this religious um, fight. There's still funding uh, in foreign assistance less now, but still an abstinence only, which is generally, you know, based on religious beliefs, which is also not effective. Um, you have things like the anti-prostitution pledge, um, where you have to pledge to oppose prostitution. Again, it's not directly quote unquote religious in the text of it, but that is what's underlying it, and there's been a whole set of lawsuits. In fact, it went all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, and yet the administration is still continuing to implement it. Um, I mentioned the piece about uh, undocumented minors. Um, you know, there's also other areas where, where you know, it's, it's based not on public health, but, but on sort of ideological concern about abortion. I mean, another example is, is the implementation of the Helms Amendment, which restricts um, the use of foreign assistance funds for uh, abortion overseas, but the administration continues to prohibit any abortion funding overseas whatsoever, including life-saving abortions, abortions for women who have been raped in conflict, um, nothing. And that's the decision that the Obama administration has made, and it's based, um, I mean, because there's been pushback from, from folks on who are religiously affiliated um, service providers who have said, you know, literally, we will stop providing any assistance anywhere um, if you allow abortions to go on. This is similar to what we saw with the gay adoptions where, where places would just say, we will not you know, do any adoptions at all um, if you allow LGBT couples to adopt. So it's, it's really concerning. In many of these cases, it's not on its face about religion, but it is clearly what is, what is behind the scenes. Uh, again, I'm Mohini from Napoff, but 
Uh, in addition from being from NAPOF, uh, I'm a fellow. I'm funded by If When How, formerly Law Students for Reproductive Justice. So my question uh, is uh, kind of veering into a sort of battle of the professions question. Um, a lot of what you were talking about were doctors offering their opinions and feeling like they're being overridden by religious opinions and political opinions that don't feed into evidence-based practice. Um, and there's also this interplay of like legal organizations that are very well funded, like the Thomas More Society jumping in whenever it can. But we have those on our end too, right? Like you're from the Center for Reproductive Rights. How, <laughs> how, how are we, how do we more efficiently support our own legal um, efforts? How are we, how can we better have lawyers who lawyer for reproductive justice? Money. <laughs> I'll stop there, yeah. <laughs> but some of it, some of it is money. I think some of it is, um, you know, the work if when how is doing, um, which is building, you know, um, the the fellows, for example, or people who belong to chapters and at law schools. Um, many of them they go on to work in law firms. They go on to work in healthcare systems. They go on to work in, um, in advocacy organizations. <laughs> Um, and so the, the, you know, building this um, awareness and knowledge and, you know, what, frankly, what all of you in this room are doing you're with your own organizations and belonging to this coalition, um, I do think that that is part of it um, um, because it requires both legal strategies and other kinds of advocacy strategies working in partnership. It requires what I always think of as inside-outside advocacy. We need people in health departments. We need people inside um, insurance companies also who are aware and are working to um, limit the impact of these restrictions. These are long-term strategies as well. I'll just add to that because I know you need to talk about CRR. Um, and it, they're long and hard and difficult, but in ways that make sense. We have so many different interest groups, and particularly on the si this side of the argument, you know, we have a lot of things that we agree on and a lot of things that we don't. So it takes a long, long time to establish trust, to establish common ground, especially when uh, on the more progressive side, we are used to developing a consensus before we move forward. And that's really difficult, particularly on the progressive side. It's easier when you're more on a black and white, more conservative side, because you can kind of force agreement. Uh, so I will say there's a good model for this. It's um, the Republican Party starting in the 70s, started infiltrating think tanks and uh, hospitals and a lot of fellowship programs and you know, 20, 30 years, they really had an impact on policy, Supreme Court justices, regulatory systems, and uh, supporters in the field for that point of view. And it really worked well, and that's a good thing for us to think about replicating. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's, yes, I think it's important to, to remember that sort of not all is lost and throw up our hands and that there are things that, yeah. that, that people um, can do. There are certainly affirmative, uh, you know, bills on the other side. I mean, I mentioned the uh, the Do No Harm Act. There was the Protect Women from Corporate Interference Act. There's Women's Health Protection Act. There's Act for Women Act. There's the March Act. There's a lot of acts. Um, you know, as, as as folks know here in D.C., those are you know multi-year processes. And obviously, um, you know, it, it, the challenge on working on some of these issues is that people, by and large, have fairly rigid opinions about this by the time they, they get into the Senate or the House. And we are not a 501c4, so we have no part in, in the electoral piece. But obviously, you know, if you have a bunch of people in Congress who are, you know, not pro-choice, you're going to end up with a different set of results than if you have uh, folks that are supportive. And so that's one piece of it. Um, you know, getting, getting people interested in these issues, I think, you know, elevating these issues, the storytelling work even is, I think, is important and, and bringing these out. I, I think Advocates for Youth has a great, um, you know, publication, the sort of one in three where people talk about this, shout your abortion. There's a lot of different ones we're talking, you know, sort of bringing these out of the out of the closet, as it were, that, that these are not, you know, shameful things. These are not uncommon things. These are these are needs that that people have all the time. 
Um, you know, there's also the challenge, I think, of, of there have been sociological studies that show that elected officials tend to be much more conservatives even than their constituents. Um, and that includes people on both sides of the aisle. Um, so I, I think that's, that's hard and, and, you know, being in touch with constituents and, and, and emphasizing what policies you're, you're for and against um, is, is important too. So there's a lot of pieces to it. I don't think there's a simple answer though. Tough question. One more. I, we're gonna take one more question, but I also wanted to say this forum is a perfect example. The Coalition for Liberty and Justice is meant to bring out these issues, to bring out the progressive idea of these issues, to bring out why and how the awareness that this is happening. So being here today is absolutely part of that. So we're thank you for that. Hello, my name is Glenn. I work at New Ways Ministry, uh, where we educate Catholics on LGBTQ realities. And my question, um, sort of follows what Wayne was saying earlier about the breadth of providers, not just looking at them uh, from a doctor-only perspective. I don't know if this is too far, but with early sexual education programs, have you seen any progress, um, at least on the education of the different, of what can be provided uh, within Catholic education? I know, and this is purely anecdotal, but in my experience in eighth grade at a Catholic diocesan school, it was just, well, this is how you have babies, so have babies once you're married. Uh, <laughs> and then in high school, the focus um, was on STIs, but it was interesting where in that, again, anecdotal situation, uh, it was a government educator that came into the classroom. Um, I was at a Jesuit high school and the teacher couldn't talk about any of the issues. They could be in the classroom, but all they could do is make sure that students were listening. Um, and, facil and facilitate that part. Have you, do you know anything about the sexual education? Is that part of your focus? And are there any strategies that we can learn from there to apply in other areas of uh, where there are different providers? Great question, Glenn, thank you. Um, yes, as, uh, in terms of ARHP and my work, we deal a lot with sexuality education um, for all ages. Um, I would say right now it's a little bit broken. Um, and remains so after years of onslaught uh, in terms of sexuality, healthy sexuality education at all developmental ages, starting at a young age and moving on into young adulthood. And, and for us, we're still learning. So, um, and there are wonderful models for this. They're excellent, well-developed curricula. Uh, there are organizations like CECUS and uh, QUADES and all these other acronyms out there who that's their job, to try to identify what the evidence says makes the most sense for sex education for folks at whatever age they are. So the science is there, the curricula is there, but this ideology does influence. I mean, Catholic schools in particular are horrendous, uh, but so are private uh, fundamental, fundamentalist uh, religious schools. Um, they're also, when getting back to the cray-cray state laws, you know, this uh, uh, curriculum in schools um, is very local. And there is a lot of activism on the conservative side. So there is a hodgepodge of how this is done. Uh, there tends to be more um, evidence-based comprehensive sexuality education occurring in the more urban areas as opposed to suburban, exurb, and rural. Uh, but that's a generalization. It really is all over the place. Um, it's a difficult problem to solve. It's another long-term problem. We were in a better place in the 60s and 70s than we are now um, in terms of uh, kind of helping us uh, understand in a, in a clinical and a relationship and personal way, you know, what healthy sexuality is for each of us. So uh, uh, I would say we're not in a good spot right now. And there are a lot of groups that are working on it that are very underfunded um, and a long way to go. So basically, I want to say thank you to the panel. They did a fabulous job. This has been a really wonderful conversation that will continue. You can continue it over lunch. This is exactly the kind of thing that we mean to foster at the center, at the center, at the Coalition for Liberty and Justice. And um, we really want, I think, these issues move forward when we actually have conversations with each other, when we actually go out and mobilize our constituencies to stand up for what real religious liberty actually looks like in our community. So thanks. Go talk to each other. Go enjoy a good meal. Or go to a <laughs> Oh, and the, our lunch is from 1230 to 130. So.
Go eat. Manja. I know. Oh, my God.